Good afternoon and welcome to COP26 and the Green Zone. We are live from National Grid stand here. It's really exciting. There's a great hub of excitement around the place, as you can probably you know, hear in the background. Um, we're joined this afternoon by uh, Saran Truswell, Sustainability Advisor at National Grid, and Juliet Mian from Arab. Um, one of our partners who's been working on some of the climate adaptation work that we're going to talk about this afternoon. I'm Steve Thompson, National Grid's UK Sustainability Advisor. And over the last week or so, we've heard a lot about climate mitigation and the need to reduce our emissions to achieve net zero. And quite rightly so, that's really important. What we haven't heard as much about is climate adaptation. So how are we going to deal with the effects of increased extreme weather? Um, the IPCC Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report from earlier this year it was very clear that in almost all scenarios out into the middle and, and end of the century, we're going to see increased extreme weather, um, increased frequency and intensity of storms, as an example. Um, on the back of that, the UK Committee on Climate Change also highlighted that actually we haven't done enough yet to adapt to climate change so not enough action has been taken and we need to do more and finally quite recently um, we took part in a survey with business in the community where members of the public highlighted that climate adaptation and increasing extreme weather was the biggest concern that they had related to climate change and that's really understandable because it's real and we can touch it and feel it and we see it all the time on the news um, and we also experienced it ourselves. I mean, only last week um, you only had to witness the, the travel situation that was caused by the weather um, locally in the UK, which actually stopped people getting to this conference very easily. So over the next half an hour or so, we'll talk you through some of the things that we've been doing here at National Grid um, with regards to climate adaptation. But in order to bring that to life, we're first going to show you a short film which shows some of the impacts that it can have on us and operating our business. So we are seeing the impacts of climate change in the U.S. already. You know, it's difficult to attribute the cause of any single event to something like climate change, but anybody that you talk to will tell you that, at least anecdotally, we've been seeing an increase in weather events in recent years. And not all of these events are major, you know, the, the type of big storm you might think of, like a hurricane or a tropical storm. Some are just, you know, a locally severe wind event that impacts a large number of customers for several days because, you know, that small storm that may not be something we think of being impactful hit us in a way that took out a large number of assets and resulted in a, a bunch of outages. Responding to extreme storm events is a, a big part of what we do at National Grid. Um, when a storm hits, it's all hands on deck. Um, everybody reports for their storm assignment and our focus shifts from whatever our day job is, whatever our normal priorities are, even our normal reporting structure, all of that goes out the window. And our focus is 100% on our storm assignment and getting lights back on for our customers. Extreme events have a lot of implications, both for our customers and for National Grid. The implications for the customers in the moment are pretty apparent, right? The individuals are out of the power that they need to power their lives for potentially multiple days, right? You know, we've been seeing events that are lasting three, four, or five days to get everybody restored. That has a huge impact, you know, in the moment. It also has wider reaching impacts, you know, if an individual is not confident in their ability to access reliable energy, they likely have less confidence in making the switch to something like an electric vehicle or electric heat. And these clean energy technologies are important for us to be able to meet our clean energy goals and emissions reductions goals. Fundamentally, our role is to provide a safe and reliable distribution system, and that means that we have to respond to these emerging reliability and resilience challenges. 
uh, hopefully that uh, video brought to life some of the challenges that we face. Um, and one of the other things I should also have mentioned is um, we are joined by a very special guest here um, in the Green Zone this afternoon. We're joined by Griddles the Bear, who uh, you can see has now joined the panel. Um, we will be talking to Griddles later um, and we'll come back to him to get his input into climate adaptation. Coming, coming back to the video, um, so I think we know, and as you've already said, the fact that we face these climate risks is, is not news anymore, that's not a surprise, but, it, but I wonder if you could just say a bit more about really what that means to National Grid, to an organisation with the, you know, the size and breadth of, of operations that National Grid has. Sure, um, thanks Juliet. It's really an extension of, of what we do already. So it's about managing risk and ensuring we deliver resilient networks. Um, and climate change risk is just an additional part of that, really. Um, what we have recognised, though, of course, that climate change in itself is really, really important. So although we're managing that risk, we need to do more. And one of the things that we've done is to make sure that's incorporated into our existing risk framework. Um, so we made it what we call a principal risk at National Grid. What does that actually mean in practice? It means it gets the level of focus and the importance that it really needs and deserves. But the other driver I think that we found is an external expectation. So what do the people who work with National Grid and our customers expect us to do? Now, what you may have seen last week is the UK Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, talk about something called a green financing framework. And that's an extension of um, some recommendations called the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosure, TCFD. Um, all that sounds a little bit corporate, I guess, but effectively what those things are getting to is they are recommendations and guidance for companies to disclose their climate risk and be very clear about the risks that we face and how we are dealing with those risks. And we've been doing that for the last four years, we've disclosed those risks, but as I said earlier, we recognise that we needed to do a little bit more. Now that's a really big challenge for us. We've got thousands of miles of pipelines, we've got thousands of miles of overhead lines and cables. And then we've got a, a multitude of different climate scenarios and hazards that we need to look at and kind of overlay all that information. So we thought, okay, what's, what's our next step? What are we going to do? That's what I did next was I got on the phone to Juliet and said, Juliet, can you help us, please? <laughs> so, Juliet, um, Arup have been working on this project for the, the last year, and it's been an extensive piece of research. Please could, could, please, could you tell us a little bit more about what that's involved and particularly some of the complexities and challenges that we've had to overcome? Sure, happy to. And, and thank you for calling us. It's been a, it's been a fantastic journey so far. Um, I think for both National Grid and Arup, doing a risk assessment for an individual asset and for an individual hazard, that, that's almost business as usual. But what's, what's innovative and different about this piece of work for National Grid is, is quite how complete it is. So to look at all of Grid's assets across the UK and the US, um, that, you know, I think that's 12 asset types in the UK, 16 asset types in the US. Then we've looked at every climate hazard that has the potential to impact those assets. So that's, that's 10 hazards. We've also looked at this for, for two different um, climate projections. So depending on where the emissions get to with all the conversations that are happening here at COP at the moment, either a future of two degrees global warming or four degrees global warming. Again, because of, the, because of the number of assets that National Grid have, we've looked at that over different time horizons. So we've looked out in the 2030s, 2040s, 2050s and 2070s. So overall, that means we're doing this risk assessment for, for literally millions of assets over thousands of square kilometers of, of spatial distribution. Um, if that wasn't complex enough, we've also had to work with different units for, for temperature, wind speed, etc. Between, between the UK and the US. Um, the second part then is, is assembling that data and, and using it to actually understand the, the risk. So the first thing is to understand where the hazards are, whether there are assets exposed to those hazards, and then finally how vulnerable those assets are. So I think one of the great things for, for us in Arab doing this kind of work is the 
the diversity of the team that we have to bring into it. So we need engineers, we need people who understand the physical assets, we need climate scientists, data analysts, and also we'll come on to the way this has been presented in a, in a digital tool. So we need digital specialists and people who, who specialize in, in risk and resilience. So you have to bring all of those different capabilities together. Um, so working with National Grid's so asset specialists, we've defined the, the vulnerability, how likely it is that these assets will be, will be harmed by the different hazards. Um, I think one of the things I was going to mention is that the, the, the risk geeks who might be watching this might spot that, that at the moment where we've got to is understanding asset vulnerability. There's further work to do, and we'll probably pick up on this to say, you know, how critical are those assets? It doesn't always matter if an asset fails, if it can be, if it doesn't sort of affect the criticality of supply, if it can be rapidly repaired and replaced. Um, and then I think the, the final thing that we were going to pick up on is is actually presenting this risk. So, so for us as Arab, you know, the kind of work we used to do. 10, 15 years ago, we might have presented this in a report to our clients. That might have been. A, 100 page report say but what we've done here this would have literally been thousands and thousands of pages of report so um colleagues at national grid asked us you know very rightly to present this in the form of a digital tool so that's what we've done we've actually created a tool as the way of presenting and disseminating the results because it's the only way that the the people across the business in grid can really drill down and and understand the results so i think that yeah the final point that i was going to make is this it is a difficult question for National Grid, and I, what I'm really impressed with is that you've just got stuck in because sometimes you can get slightly overwhelmed by the difficulty. And the most important thing with an issue such as climate risk, start by starting. We've understood so much already. We've learned a lot. One of the things we've learned is how much more there is still to learn, but this is a, it's a really good, solid start to answering those questions. Thanks, Julia. And that, that's, a, that's a brilliant kind of oversight of the project and, and how we've approached it. And we'll come on to some of the results and the findings from it in a second. Um, but before we do that, I think you, you touched upon some of the people elements. I'm interested, Saran, who are the people who are going to be using this data and, and what they're going to do with it? Yeah, thanks, Steve. So um, what's, what I find really exciting about the outputs from this project is that um, the results are accessible for anybody in our business to, to, to use and understand. Um, and, and quite rightly so, you know, Steve touched earlier on how important this is, and it's going to touch on all areas of our business. Um, so quite rightly, those, everybody needs to have access to this and understand what it means for them at, the, at their level. Um, so that could be anybody from asset managers, strategy planners, right up to our group executives at board level. Um, so, for example, an asset manager, they may use this information to understand what parts of their specific network that they're responsible for are going to be affected by these hazards. Um, they could then make more informed decisions as to when and where and if they need to put in place climate change mitigation uh, methods um, and what that might look like. Um, as Juliet said, you know, we're just on the start of this journey. So it may be that we look at these results and say, well, we're going to focus on a particular business area and say we're going to do a more bespoke, in-depth study based on sort of uh, more engineering information to understand in more detail what this could potentially mean, um, you know, and looking at those short, medium and long-term scenarios. Um, and then we've just got a, a more informed picture then of, of what, you know, what that action plan needs to look like. Um, at a more strategic level, um, you know, this could inform our future investment decision making. Um, you know, so if we've got plans of how we're going to uh, build new infrastructure on our networks and where that's going to be, you know, considering this kind of information now may mean that we look at changing some of those plans. Um, but again, we've got all this data to underpin that and, and we're, we're more informed than we've ever been. Um, we can also use this when we're having conversations with our investors and as Steve mentioned earlier, the TCFD um, and also our climate disclosure project. Um, you know, we have to report to these on an annual basis and having all of this information at our fingertips just helps us to tell our story, you know, to say how we are embedding climate change risk uh, in, into how we're managing our networks and, and what that means for National Grid. Um, so that's, I realise that's quite corporate and at a business level, um, but ultimately bringing this back to what we do, um, it's so important for our customers and consumers, particularly as we're moving to greater electrification of our networks. And I think that's an interesting point, Saran. So you mentioned kind of that increasing electrification. 
Um, and I said right at the very start of the, of the broadcast today about the focus on climate change mitigation um, and that we're talking very specifically here about adaptation. And in fact, you could argue that there's not actually a lot of overlap because um, while we're reducing climate emissions and we've got plans for climate mitigation, we still need to adapt to extreme weather because that's going to happen regardless of the scenarios that we take. And so would you say this is probably the, that, that increased electrification and increased infrastructure requirements for mitigation is probably one of the areas where mitigation and adaptation actually do overlap? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and as we move towards increasing electrification, you know, we're going to require more of the equipment that we use today to transport that electricity directly to our customers. And that, that brings me to, a, to an interesting question, which is the, the role of National Grid and the resilience of, of the grid in the future, I think, will become increasingly important and it's changing. So, open question, is, is this something that you guys are losing sleep about, how you manage to keep it resilient in the, in the face of an uncertain future? Um, that's, a, that's a really good question, Julia. Um, I'm going to say no, it doesn't. And, and I think it builds on the point that I made earlier that this is what we do. This is an extension of what we do in terms of managing risk and having resilient networks. But I also think it's because we're not starting from scratch so we we've already done and we already do quite a lot to adapt to climate change um, and I've kind of split it into two areas really and, and one is proactive and so that's around say investing um, in our sites so as an example over the last 10 years or so we've invested in increasing flood defenses uh, at around 50 of our sites um, to proactively manage that risk <coughs> excuse me um, and but I think the second bit is the um, adapting to severe weather today um, and you saw in the film at the very start of the broadcast just what that means in reality um, and a lot of that is focused on processes and risk management but the other side of that is the people and the people who are out on the ground who are having to respond to these severe weather conditions and in some cases and quite often in these cases are, are going out into the unknown and uncertain because they don't know what they're going to find when they get out there and so and I think we've got we've got those processes in place in order to to uh, to respond to that severe weather today and, and actually Steve that's something that I remember seeing not not in the context of severe weather but but COVID so early on in the UK I, I guess it was sort of March 2020 I remember seeing a story about the national grid operators who are actually living in isolation away from their home friends family for sort of six weeks at a time so that they could continue to operate the grid which honestly I'd never thought about it. and it does make you realize that this is at the end of the day it's the people who will keep national grid services going I, I, absolutely I mean I guess that's a really good example and 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 it was an amazing thing that those people did I mean not just the people who who lived on site at our, at our main office in Warwick um, in order to ensure that the, the control room operations continue during the, the early stages of the pandemic when there was a huge amount of uncertainty for everybody um, but also um, across our organization in the UK and the US our, our operational people who with obviously lots of additional controls in place um, to manage the risk associated with COVID-19 we're still going out to our sites and doing their jobs to ensure the resilience of our networks I mean just coming back to the um, the people who lived on site um, in Warwick um, for those for, for people watching who don't know we had a number of people who lived on site they and we developed um, some quite funky little pods for them to stay on site so um, it it helped us to to manage the risk around the resilience of our networks and continuing to operate our networks it also managed risk for them in terms of um, being isolated and, and limiting exposure but obviously they were away from their friends and family um, so there were a few things that we did to kind of um, make that more comfortable for them one of them was that they weren't alone they weren't isolated they had a friend who sat with them in their pods um, each of the of the people who were living on site um, were given uh, a little bear called griddles who is sat here with us today uh, griddles kept them company and became actually a little bit of um, a national grid icon um, and many national grid employees who are watching today will recognize griddles and know the really important role that he played in helping our people to kind of get get through that early part of the pandemic um, so i guess a heartfelt thank you from everyone at National Grid to Griddles and thank you for joining us today in the Green Zone. Um, 
but, but more seriously, I guess it does um, underline the role that our people play, ensuring that, that, that we are resilient. Um, I guess just, just moving on from that bit now, and, and maybe let's get into a little bit more of you know, the results. What, what did we actually find from the, from the work that we undertook, Julia, in terms of the risk analysis? Yeah, so um, there's, a, there's a slide here showing a, a map of, of some of the findings. And I think, I mean, this is the point about the tool, right? Because actually, it's very hard to talk through these findings in the level of detail that we have them on a, on a small map like this. So there's a few statements I'm going to make to explain our findings that are probably going to sound sort of blindingly obvious, such as the fact that in the future, all assets are facing an increased risk from at least one climate hazard. Um, again, what the, the value in this tool is not to make those sort of sweeping comments like that because we knew that much already. But what we have behind this now is the it's the evidence, it's the data, it's the numbers. Um, the, the, the map that we've got up at the moment is about uh, riverine flooding. So we've been looking, you know, the flood occurrence and the risk relates to how much more frequently these flood events will occur in the future and then how much harm or how much damage can happen to assets as, as a result of it. Um, and both river and coastal floodings were certainly some of them, one of the more significant hazards affecting all of, all of the assets, obviously, that are exposed. So, so only the assets that are close to rivers or, or in coastal areas. But we did find both in the UK and the US looking out to 2070, there, there are no assets in coastal areas that aren't at risk of, of damage as a result of flooding. And that's the kind of information that the National Grid can use then to, to make the decisions now that will enable the grid to be, to be fit for the future. There's a, there's a second slide that's, that's showing the data around the, the temperature occurrence in, in the US. Um, again, this is something that's huge. So, so the, the grid squares that we've analyzed and presented this data on in, in the US are, are seven kilometer squares. So there's a, there's a huge number of those and there's a, there's a lot of information sitting behind them. Um, what this does do is gives, it gives us an understanding of, of the overall risk to different types of assets, to different types of flood. And I think exactly as you were saying before, Saran, it, with that information, you can then zoom in and do something much more detailed. So we haven't, we haven't modeled every individual asset with all of its engineering parameters, its age, its condition, what it was de designed for. But we know they're there. We know they have the potential to be harmed. And that's the thing that allows us to, to zoom in a bit more. A, a couple of other sort of high level findings Low temperature has historically been a big concern for, for grid with a number of its assets, so either freeze-thaw events or you know, significantly cold weather. That's not going to happen as much in the future. We won't have as much freeze-thaw. We won't have as much extremely low temperatures, but they will still occur. And, and one of the important things about this as well has been to communicate the, the uncertainty with all of this data. We, we know that the frequency, you know, on average, will will decrease for these cold weather events but we also do have to expect them do have to anticipate and prepare for them um so yeah i, I think as i say the, the real the real beauty of this is is how we've presented it in a tool so that you can so you can dive in and i think saran you're going to talk through a bit more how we've done that yeah sure so um we're just going to play a short video in the background which is it basically gives you a flavor and a demonstration of how the tool could be used in practice uh, it's a uk the uk element um but that you know we have scaled this up to us and you can see at a portfolio level as well so um we talked about um some of the results um and you know the beauty of this is that anybody can access this within our business. Um, it's visual, it's interactive, um, you know, and uh, yeah, so if we look at the video going forward, so this just gives you an overview of some of the uh, hazards that we've considered. So high, low temperatures, heat waves, three, four events, um, lightning, wind, and then compound events, which pull some of those hazards together. Um, and then each one has a, um, a vulnerability uh, assessment put onto it and then um, the exposure of that asset uh, to that hazard. And so you can see here you've got um, as we go through, we're looking at electricity transmission, and then we drill down further into what that means for our overhead lines. Um, you can extract 
the data out of the tool. So the bar, the bar graphs that you say, see there, which show the vulnerability um, and then the risk profile, um, you can actually extract that data out if you wanted to do more detailed analysis on it. Um, and then the graphs at the bottom, you know, the beauty of this is that as you start to click through and you drill down, you can see how that is changing over time. Um, you can filter out on different decades, so you may just want to look at short term from the baseline from now to say to 2030, or those full range right out to 2070. Um, and, you know, you, you might see as we go through, there's lots of different colours on there, particularly the areas of, of, of dark, and you might look at that and think, oh, that looks quite scary. Um, uh, the idea is it's not to scare people, it's to say, well, this is, um, you know, uh, the potential risk and it doesn't actually mean that this is what is going to happen. So it's our job then to use this tool um, to then translate how much that hazard risk is changing um, and what we need to do to ensure that that damage to our networks does not happen in the future. Um, you know, and we've got a greater understanding than we've ever had before so we can now build on that um, and then prioritise the right decisions in the right places for our networks. Um, so, Steve, I think you're going to give us some examples now of how that adaptation would actually work in practice and how you know, we're responding to climate change risk to make sure that this damage doesn't occur in the future. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Saran. Um, I guess just to kind of wrap up, really, um, and, and cover and bring together some of the areas we, we've talked about. So, um, I think the first is, and um, I make no apology for kind of underlining this point, is the role of the, that our people play. Um, um, you, again, you saw the film at the start and the amazing work that some of our people in our US business in particular do in terms of ensuring the impact on our customers is limited as much as possible when we experience this extreme weather. And as the film showed, it, it really is extreme weather. What we hope is that the data and the analysis from this tool will help to better inform them, to better inform the tools and the processes to, to give them a better understanding of how to respond to those severe weather events. Um, the second bit is the, the proactive investment. Um, I talked about the investment we'd made in the UK to reduce flood risk on around 50 of our sites. Um, we're only taking a bit of work to, to expand that and looking at, you know, say the next hundred sites of where we could do this. I think the beauty of this information as well, though, is it, it helps us to make those decisions, but also it, it doesn't mean we have to make decisions today. It gives us information to make sure we make the right decisions and make those decisions once rather than make snap decisions where we might have to kind of change our mind and do something different um, at some point in the future. Um, and then I guess the final bit I'd want to kind of touch upon here, and it's something that we've not really talked about um, as we've been going through the presentation, but it's looking at alternative ways of managing the risk. Um, and, and one of the things that we've been doing uh, at National Grid over a number of years is, is looking at different ways to use and manage the, the land that we own to deliver um, and, and enhance the natural environment. So what can we do differently with that land to have a positive impact? Now, one of those ways might be to help to mitigate the climate risk that we've been, talked about, to been talking about today, um, such as um, natural flood defences and using our land um, to help mitigate flood risk in kind of local and regional spaces. Um, and if you listened into our broadcast yesterday on the fair transition, you'll have heard Laura Bartle, our Net Zero Strategy Manager, talking about this in a little bit more detail in terms of what we're doing to enhance the natural environment. Um, it comes back to the information that we're getting from this process will help us to make those decisions better and understand where we can take those actions. And then I think the, the final bit for me kind of to, to wrap this up is around collaboration and working with others. Um, so Juliet touched upon um, the, the point of the, the project itself has been really collaborative and had lots of people from different backgrounds and with different skill sets involved. Um, one of the things that we're doing at the moment is, is trying to broaden our engagement with, with the industry. We are sponsoring the Business Continuity Industries Climate Risk Report um, for this year, which, we help, which what we hope will highlight is where some of these risks occur for different businesses and where across our industry further action can be taken. But coming back to the work that we've been talking about today, how can we share this information with a wider group of customers, stakeholders, partners, and anyone who's interested, because we can't solve this on our own, and quite often these risks need to be mitigated at a broader level, not just associated with our assets, but in the regions that we work. And so I think the one 
thing that I would like to see with this work going forward is, is, is having that greater level of collaboration and driving forward to a shared solution to, to mitigate the, the risks that are associated with climate change that we've been talking about this afternoon. Um, so thank you very much for everyone for, for kind of listening in. Um, I think now we're going to, to take some questions and answers. I think we've had some questions through. We've got quite a few questions. We've got yeah. quite a few questions, which is really great because that means people are interested. Yes, yeah, um, sure. Um, any difficult ones around, please pass them to Griddles. Well, well, He's well prepared. Well, Griddles actually has some questions of his own as well, so <laughs> <laughs> unsurprisingly. So, um, so first question. So uh, are national grids, gas or electricity assets already being impacted? by the effects of climate change so we obviously showed the video uh, at the start which was about how our US business in particular is being impacted but I wonder if we could perhaps draw out some of the UK effects that we've seen on our on our gas and electricity networks yeah sure and I think the um, mm. the main example I'd use around is the, the one around flood risk that's the one that's been most understood and most seen um, and in the UK over the last probably 15 years or so we've seen increased experience of, of, of really severe flooding um, and some of our sites have come under risk from that the really good news is we've not experienced anything really difficult in terms of losing supply or anything like that um, because we put the mitigations in place to, to manage that risk so um, I think yeah you're right in the answer to the question is really yeah we're seeing that we've seen it all the time and if I, if I could just follow, follow up on that one because and it was one of the things I was reflecting Saran when you were mentioning the looking at all those risks could be scary but th this is for me from a sort of personal point of view what would be a lot more scary is to have a grid operator in the UK who thought we understand our risks we're fine we don't need to do anything so yeah. you know no room for complacency understanding that we're already seeing these risks and they are going to continue to increase absolutely so uh, the next top rated question is for griddles <laughs> so griddles um, what do you think about climate change and how it affects your species? I'm very curious to see how <laughs> Steve's going to deal with this one. So, so I, I, it's funny, I was, I was speaking to Griddles earlier about this, fortunately. So, um, as you'd imagine, he's really concerned. Um, and, you know, he advocates everything that we're trying to achieve at the conference this week. Um, He's a, he's a very environment, environmentally conscious bear. Um, he did say he was particularly interested in the work that we're doing on the natural environment um, and, and certainly encouraging endangered species um, and, and things like that and managing our land differently. So he, so he, he absolutely appreciates yeah. that. So if I can just build on that as well. So some of the work that we're doing around um, managing our non-operational land, um, one of our key um, aims of that is to engage with partners and local communities who are working in the local area so that might be environmental conservation charities you know wildlife charities how we can understand from an ecosystem service perspective you know what is that land uh, delivering for us communities and biodiversity nature um, and how can we manage that in a more responsible way that you know um, enhances those benefits for all so that's you know and linking in with what you said earlier Steve about managing our flood risk you know how can we uh, adapt that approach in terms of potentially natural flood management I, I think just one final point on that, Saran. We see that with a lot of the elements of our focus on the environment, that there's a lot of interaction between them. They're not you know, separate things that we should focus on. So, you know, separate climate change and the natural environment and biodiversity, that all of those things are interlinked and actually we can develop solutions that deliver multiple benefits. Yeah, great. Okay, so the next question. Um, with the onset of increasingly dramatic weather events, what can we do to ensure we are not only decarbonising but also creating resiliency for our customers? So can I pick up that sure. one? Because uh, having, having been at the COP and in a lot of discussions over the last week or so, this to me is one of the key topics. So, so quite often in the climate discussion we have people over here who are decarbonising, people over here who are promoting adaptation and resilience. And I think for National Grid, you can only be at the centre of both of those. You've, you know, there's only one future for National Grid, which is you have achieved net zero and you're also resilient to the changing climate. And I think we must decarbonise to manage the, the carbon emissions and make sure that the climate is not as extreme as it could be. But I do think it's important. You know, I've heard the, the one and a half degrees scenario. It's described as the the less terrifying future mm -hmm. there will still be the climate change will still happen yeah. and what we're doing with the decarbonization is making sure it's not completely terrifying yeah <laughs> but yeah <laughs> okay 
So, um, as most of the new asset connections that will enable net zero are around our coastal areas, will the output of this risk tool be shared with our developers? That would be for you, I think. Yeah, yeah sure, and I think I can put, touch on a little bit in the collaboration point, but um, I certainly see us being able to share this information. Um, in fact, I think that's really huge value in, in doing that. Um, it is really important we work with our developers, with um, any of our partners on any of our projects to make sure that when we're developing those projects, we fully understand any of the risks associated with it. I would suggest that's probably business as usual. That's what we would do. Um, and so this would just be an extension of that in making sure that where well, we've got that better information, we share that with our, with our developers, our partners, whoever we're working with on any project. Yeah, and if I can just build on that, Steve. So I think, um, I, as Juliet mentioned earlier, you know, we are just starting out on this journey. So we realise that we have this incredible data set at our fingertips. And yes, we're going to start engaging externally with people. Um, but this is just the first phase. You know, so th the beauty of how the tool and the research has all been set up is that we can adapt that going forward. So we can we can respond to changing data sets. You know, as climate science develops, we can we can underpin that back into the research into the tool. Um, but then there's also a piece around, um, you know, um, as our business changes as well, you know, um, as new assets come on, we need to make sure that those are reflected um, within the data and then outputting into that tool. So there's a constant kind of development piece that we'll be looking at, and that will come up out also in terms of the engagement with developers, potentially other network infrastructure providers and other industries as well. You know, this is not just applicable for energy. If you think about how our networks impact the general kind of society, you know, there's loads of different elements that we could look at, you know, to expand this project as we go forward. And if I can quickly, do, just, just to follow on from that, because something that I'm interested in is also not, there's sharing the actual results that you have with people that you work with, but, but does National Grid do anything about sharing lessons and findings with other grid operators around the world? Because you're not the only grid operators dealing with climate hazards and others mm -hmm. in, in other parts of the world are, you know, already right in the middle of that. So, so I can't say that I know specifically that we do on this particular topic, but given that we do a lot of engagement with different networks across the world on these kind of challenges, then it would surprise me greatly if we didn't, if didn't. As while I'm not directly involved <laughs> yeah. in that. Um, and, and certainly as we evolve our information um, and, and do start to work more collaboratively with different grids and become more interconnected, you know, we've seen more interconnection to Europe, for an example, I think that will become increasingly important, Juliet. Yeah. Yeah. So we have got a question that's sort of linked into this. So um, is the climate change risk tool available externally? So at the moment it's not. Um, we're actually, um, we haven't actually launched it formally across our business yet, um, but that's something that we're going to be looking at very, very soon. Um, so I think that's kind of our next phase, but absolutely linking back to what we've just said, you know, there is space to have that discussion in the future. Um, so yeah. Okay. Um, what climate variables are national grids gas and electricity assets at most risk from so i'll, I'll give it a go okay. and, and then this yeah this, this was one where it was hard it's hard to answer that on a even a national level certainly from a sort of national uk plus us level every asset can be harmed by different hazards mm -hmm. um and they're you know they're all very interconnected and dependent on each other as well so it is it is a complicated question but i think one of the things that we have shown is flooding and that's you've mentioned mm -hmm. that steve that's something that we're that we're seeing already so river flooding for those assets that are in the vicinity of, of rivers and coastal coastal flooding or m much more frequent occurrence of storm surge and, and sea level rise and again that's one of the common themes throughout all of the discussions at cop you know the water whatever industry we're in water seems to weave through everything and the problems in different parts of the world is either too much or too little water so not surprising that we're mm -hmm. seeing flooding as being one of the one of the bigger hazards yeah. for grid and Go on. if i just jump in so um we've talked quite a bit about our operational ha assets um but we've also considered um the impact on our office locations and service centers um you know that's really important in terms of where our employees are based where they work um and in terms of um looking out to the future certainly high temperatures is something that is considered as, as a risk going forward so that's something to think about of course that that will touch everybody across our employee base whether operational or not 
and yeah, the, the other point I was just going to make, Saran, is, is really just building on that, how this work evolves, and um, why it's a difficult question to answer, I guess, is that um, the areas that we've highlighted are those, probably those areas where we're more confident um, around the data and the climate scenarios. There's still a lot of uncertainty around some of those hazards. Um, and so I'll use kind of lightning strikes as an example. You know, the confidence levels on the frequency of, the, of those are, are a little bit lower. But as we get better data and information, we'll be able to kind of feed that in, and that'll give us more confidence to kind of answer those specific yeah. questions, I guess. Which is a great point. That's the, the, known, the known unknowns, <laughs> of which there are plenty. Yeah. Okay, just a couple of questions left. So, um, what does Ofgem think about funding climate adaptation in future gas and electricity price controls? <laughs> That's a very good question, Saran. And um, I think the straightforward answer is that the, um, the 50 or so sites that I talked about previously where we've invested in flood defences were funded as part of our Rio T1 regulatory, uh, regulatory price control. And so I was underpinned by a very strong business case but on probabilistic climate scenarios that, that demonstrated where we needed to make that targeted investment at those sites. Um, what it just kind of reinforces is that work that we're doing here will feed into developing similar such business cases to demonstrate where and um, where we need to invest um, today or where we might need to do that in the longer term or where we just need more information to have that to have that certainty okay. one final question rounding off for griddles how did griddles the bear travel to the event today oh. <laughs> well <laughs> well, obviously, very sustainably. Um, it, I, I'll, I'll confess. Made him walk. I, I, conf <laughs> I confess he travelled with me. Um, <laughs> I made him as comfortable as possible um, uh, amongst the, the other things that I, that I brought to the conference. But effectively, he, tr he travelled up to the conference on the train with me earlier in the week. Um, he's had a very enjoyable week. Um, he's looking forward to another day in the green zone uh, tomorrow, and then and then having a train journey back with me um, on Thursday. Thank you. And that's it. We, that's all the questions. Thanks. Thanks. So, thank, th yeah. so, um, so it just remains for me to say thank you to Saran, thank you to Juliet, thank you, of course, to Griddles, and thank you to, to everyone. And, and I'm sure there are many thousands of you out there watching this live. <laughs> um, thank you for, for watching and, and listening in today. Um, and just to remind anyone that we are broadcasting um, a number of events during the course of the week. Um, and please do join us later today for our next broadcast, which is at 4 o'clock this afternoon. Thank you very much.